Welcome to another Animus podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Matteo Traversen. He's going to be sharing his coaching journey from a, a student of Animus all the way to working for Animus on our introduction to coaching days. Matteo is going to be sharing with us what it's like in the world being a, a young coach, both the, the perks and the challenges, as well as talking about his business leadership programs. Hey Matteo, great to have you with us. Nice to be here. So you do a bit of work with us here at Animus. You do our introduction to coaching days. Yeah. And it's sort of, you know, really lovely to have had you come through the school mm. uh, and now sharing people what we're about and how, how we do it. Um, and yes, what, what, what was your experience of going through Animus? Um, my experience was, it was, to be honest, really quite fun and um, eye-opening. I think that's how I would describe it. Because before, before I was teaching physics and I was really looking for something that would, that felt a little bit more expansive and had a bit more potential for the kind of things I wanted to achieve in the world and the impact I wanted to have. And when I found, um, when I found Animas and, and coaching in general, that's, that's when I knew this is the thing. So what led you, so there you are teaching physics uh, yeah. in a school. Well, what kind of triggered the I want to be a coach or the exploration of coaching? It was um, mostly thanks to a friend actually. Um, a friend I met randomly, um, we became very close and, and the more I learned about the kind of work that she was doing, she had actually started uh, a non-profit organization that helps young people in prison get back into society. Okay. And through that work, she'd been to Harvard and Cambridge, so she should have had this pedigree uh, that as a physicist I, I sort of accepted in, in many ways and, and that was the, the first seed into me looking into it uh, because I respected her therefore I assumed that there must have been some meat to the coaching mm. itself and once I went for it I, I was hooked. Yeah. So, and, and how did you find Animus then? So you're, you're working with, you've, you've got a friend who's yeah. working in sort of I suppose a coaching way. What was it that led you to, the, to, to Animus's doorstep? It was, um, if I have to be honest, it was mostly because they did weekends and it fit with my <laughs> teaching uh, diary, but it was also recommended to, to my friend uh, who runs that company. And so I thought, yes, it fits with time. Uh, I've heard good things about them. I'm going to go for it. So, so we were sort of time, time convenient. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and so did you get the payoff that you were looking for? Um, I don't know whether I necessarily went in with a specific payoff in mind. Okay. It was more, um, what, what is the next right step that opens more doors, that opens more possibilities and more avenues? And I think that is really what I was looking for. Well, I suppose that is a payoff in itself. It was, how can I expand my possibilities and the directions in which I could go into? And it absolutely blew that door <laughs> wide open. Awesome, yeah. awesome. And do you, do you remember any particular experience or, or moment that sort of was catalytic in that? Um, well, the, the first time that I was absolutely hooked on coaching itself was the very first day of the Foundations course. Okay. And that is where uh, me and my partner, we had just started doing, I think, the second or third um, uh, practice, essentially, with each other. And we started coaching, I started coaching her. And at some point, she broke down into tears. And at that moment, I went, oh crap. <laughs> and uh, because all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is, this is serious. This is a big responsibility I have in my hands to, to hold this person's space. And, and that is where immediately I felt almost like this bubble, I, I fell into flow, at least that's, I mm. wouldn't necessarily have to describe it then as that, but I recognize it now that it was just a really deep state of flow where I was totally with her. Um, and there was so much emotion coming out of that first conversation. When it finished, I just had to get up and had just these chills down my back because of that thing that happened and I couldn't, I was like, I, I need to have more of this. <laughs> this is amazing, you know. Uh, it was such a different experience than anything I had before. So that was the first time I really, really hooked on coaching. So that, that having to have more of it, what, so mm. what are you doing now that's enabling you to have, have more of that? Yeah, I really, 
I really look for the places where I can have the most impact and therefore uh, you can get a sense of yes I've had that kind of I've made that kind of difference with the people around me. So a lot of the work that I do is um, a little bit in, in schools so I, I've coached in and continue to coach in a few schools uh, independent schools for now um, and is it, it, sorry to jump in is that yeah. is that with the is that with the students or the teachers or a mixture with with the students and also some leadership stuff with the teachers because part of the other work that I do is leadership training and there's a lot of coaching that that gets that is part of that essentially cool yeah. cool so you're, you're working in in schools with the, the students and the teachers and wh where else are you doing that that work um so the, the, well, the, the coaching work. The, the coaching work, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, with, a coach, with the students and the, and the schools, there's also uh, in the leadership sector, because of my work in, as a leadership trainer, uh, I've done quite a bit of work with some aspiring business owners, current business owners, a few executives. And that has been really interesting because all of a sudden, I mean, the, the teaching, the coaching students made sense. I was a teacher. I look like a child, uh, so it it was fairly easy, fairly easy going. The the leadership stuff, I personally, although I thought I could do it, I didn't necessarily think other people would think that. Okay. Because of my age, because of my background, and it turns out that was a bit of a limiting belief for me actually, and the world slowly sh started showing me that it was false. That is where I started training people who are twice my age in communication skills and leadership skills. And that is where I started coaching people who have had entirely different experiences in their lives and twice the amount of time uh, of experiences. And I was still able to, to give value and provide um, a space where they could really think differently. So what got you into to leadership training? So you, you sort of... You've you've uh, you've been a teacher. Mm. Then you you learn to be a coach. Is there a point where you stop teaching and start running a coaching practice, or was that? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I when I finished the course, I think it was February. Within a month, I gave in my resignation letter to my school and told them at the end of the school period, I'm I'm leaving. So once that happened, I had about six months worth of savings to not be homeless. And uh, I decided I'm gonna do this 100% or, or not. Now, I wasn't as brave as it sounds because actually um, teaching is, is a fairly easy thing to have on the side as well. Okay. And so I did, especially at the beginning, do a bit of supply teaching while I was also picking up uh, speed with the leadership training. So this is really interesting because you know, there, are, there are coaches that have this, this feeling or this sense that they should give up their old life and do something, you know, and jump into the coaching 100%. Yeah. And for some people that really, really works. That's the, the driver that they mm. need. But it, it's really nice to hear that although you were stopping your teaching, you, there was a balance, not, not a balance, there was a, a safety that you could hold on to that you could fall back on if you needed to as you built up your coaching practice. Yeah, yeah well, there's definitely, uh, I enjoyed taking risks, but there were always calculated risks. I think it would have been, um, without a backup plan, that would have been a lot more difficult and perhaps I wouldn't necessarily have jumped in as I did. So when did you start doing the, the leadership stuff then? How did that sort of come about for you? That was actually, that actually started um, before I even finished teaching. It was a practice client that I had on the Animus course. He happened to be a professional uh, trainer and actor. And he started doing some work with a company that needed people who could do it in Italian. And he suggested me, so I was recommended to them. So you speak Italian? It's my first language. Uh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I actually coach in, and work in three languages. Uh, Italian, Spanish, and English. Okay, all right. So you're, you're one of those coaches that, that can travel the world, speak that, that first language with different people. Does that broaden the... Uh, the clientele that you can work with? To some extent. Um, the, uh, Italian hasn't been particularly useful because in Italy there just isn't much of a culture around what coaching can give. Uh, not, many, not very many people actually know what it is and even if they did, it's a hard sell to get them to see the value in it and actually pay for it. 
So, but, but it has been useful from the leadership training side. In fact, the first job I had with them, I was sent to Rome a couple of times to deliver uh, for a big company over there. So, so that actually has taken me quite a lot of places. The coaching, I do have clients in Montenegro and all the way in San Francisco. And I've had a few clients in, in Spanish and Italian. But most of them have been because of people I knew here in London rather than right. in the respective country. Right. So you've so that's really interesting. So that the leadership sort of came about because uh, working with somebody at Animus who mm. was working with a company, so that kind of serendipitous uh, interaction that, yeah. that led to that. And it feels like that the leadership is very much part of what you do now. Mm. So what's what's next? I suppose I mean there's so many things next. I my my strategic planning is a bit scattershot sometimes in the sense that I, I, I if it's not obvious enough I haven't really niched and I suppose because of that the marketing is a little bit more difficult. A lot of my clients come simply through either word of mouth or networking. I do a lot of networking and it would actually be quite useful uh, and perhaps a little bit less hard work to actually have a process in place that's somewhat automated uh, that would allow me to find more clients without having to go out every time and speaking <laughs> to people for hours and hours. So tell me a bit about the networking you do because a lot of coaches are, are a bit anxious about that sort of mm. the getting out there and, and doing the networking and it seems to be doing to be working for you, although you talk about yeah. automating things, what, what, what is it you're doing network-wise? Um, well, they should uh, they should find a coach like me then, because <laughs> <laughs> the it, honestly, it's one of those things that I've I've grown up all over the world, uh, across the states and Italy and Libya and Holland and Egypt and France and here and having to learn to make new friends and start from zero every single time since since a younger child, it does sort of blow away those barriers and those anxieties and those worries that sometimes stop people from from really interacting and being their authentic selves in in a conversation with strangers and to me that's almost second nature at this point because i've done it since i was so young what i would say for people who perhaps haven't had that experience it would be um well i mean obviously coaching is a great one but one of those things is with networking, which is great, especially here in London, is the question, what, what, what have we got to lose? Because just like on the tube, you're very likely not to ever see these people again if you don't want to. And, um, and so just that, what, what have you got to lose? My own company, Fearless Future Coaching, is really based on the idea that not to let your fear get in the way. Not necessarily to never f feel fear, because oftentimes it can be a healthy thing to feel, but to not let it um, stop you from doing things that you really want to achieve. So, so you're able to use your sort of your experience of, of moving around the world as a child to support you in those environments where you don't know anybody and you're walking and you're just having those conversations yeah. for the first time and you're being very authentic in that. And your company, Fearless... Fearless Future Coaching. Fearless Future Coaching. It's kind of working with that notion of, you know, get let's get out there and do it. So... Although you said you don't have a niche, I suppose you have a, a client, you might have a sort of a, a type of clientele that come to you. And what sort of person is that? It's, um, I, I have less of a choice in that when I work with schools, for instance, because it's a child that, that needs some help and support, or it's a teacher that needs some help and support. And whenever you work with organizations, big organizations, you don't really pick your clients in that way. Although, so be, as a result, you're kind of driven in mostly finding ways to build rapport with almost anybody. And because of that, it, that's not to say that I have clients that, um, that I enjoy the most working with, but it does mean that it, it, it taught me how to build rapport with the vibe, not everybody, but a, a little bit of a wider range of personalities and types than, than it might be usual, I think, as a result. Um, it's a bit of a non-answer, I realise. <laughs> so, but what it makes me think about, Joe, is just this uh, working with organisations, the, the mm. challenge with that and how we don't get to choose who we work with. And it, that, you know, that skill of going into an organisation and being able to work with anybody mm. and not having that, those usual um, uh, uh, 
chemistry conversations that you might have with somebody who you meet at a networking event or somebody that comes to your website and then is yeah. interested in coaching. Organizationally, that's that's very different, but there's also there's that whole kind of who do we report to and who wants to know what information. So if you're working with a young person, mm -hmm. you know, do their teachers want to know and how much information can you share with their teacher? If you're working with a teacher, does the head teacher want to know and how much info? Do you come across any of those sort of challenges? Yeah, all the time. With, with um, the school environment in particular, there's a lot of um, uh, health and safety things and child protection things around it as well. So you've got the law, you've got the school, you've got the parents, and you've got the child. So you have a lot of stakeholders, you're, you're spinning plates to mm -hmm. some extent. And so there's a lot of contracting that goes in at the beginning, making it clear how you want to work and how you think works best in order to, to ultimately benefit the child because that's really the person you want to work with or the particular individual in the organization that, um, that you're working with because often especially with big companies, the person you might be working with will not trust you enough to tell you some of the stuff that perhaps needs to be said for them because they're afraid of it being reported to, to the company. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, you know, it's a classic example it's that, one. that I've yeah. had where you're, you're working and the, uh, the, the client is kind of going, but you know, are you here under false pretenses to find yeah. out about me, to report me back? So there's always that, that caginess and... Yeah. Is there anything particular that you do to to build that rapport? It's um, I think that that whole bit of authenticity really makes a difference because when there's nothing you're trying to hide or or change about yourself, that gives off a vibe of um, this person might be different, but at the very least, what I see is what I get. And another element of it is that I'm quite different from the usual people that they might see. I'm often younger from a somewhat hard to define background with a slightly weird accent and they, they find it difficult to pigeonhole me. And I, f I think that is, and I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's part of the reason why that has been a little bit successful in that area because they kind of think, well, who is this person? Can't quite place them in any particular thing, but at least I can see they're not, they're not that suit. They're not part of the system. Okay, yeah. And that has helped that differentiation between me and the system has helped building that trust. Yeah, when I yeah. Do, do work around being a youth coach, one of the things we talk about is not being the center of authority. Mm. And uh, young people will push against you if they think you are the yeah. authority. So how do you show up in a way that allows them to go, you're not that, whatever that might be. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about your experience of, of Animus and mm. uh, the work that you're doing now. And I'm just curious about what's next for you? Where are you, where are you taking this all? So one thing I'm really thinking about a lot, I mean, I have many projects and avenues. One is expanding the leadership training side of things, getting to larger and larger corporations. Another one is expanding um, coaching in schools and the whole education system. There's people who are doing incredible work, uh, notably Bob, Sing Bob Singer, creating potentially a school based on coaching principles. Uh, Raquel Leonello, she's creating um, the School Performance and Wellbeing Alliance, which is essentially training teachers in a lot of these coaching skills. And I think one, one thing as a whole that I want to see is the impact of coaching really expanding. How do we scale coaching? It's such a personal thing mm. uh, that is, you can't just copy resources um, or copy yourself and make some clones. <laughs> go, go and make a difference in the world. And so really what is, what is an effective way to expands the, the potential of coaching so that more people communicate in a different way, perhaps have a different mindset. Um, and, and to do that, uh, you know, doing more work with schools, doing more work in large organizations for leadership, potentially writing a book, and maybe expanding my public speaking. Awesome stuff, yeah. brilliant, great. So where, where can people find you uh, if they want you either as a, as a coach or as a, as a leadership professional? Where would we find you? So um, for leadership, they can look on Aspire Leadership. They can Google that, it's always the first one. And uh, if they want to find me, you can look on uh, fearlessfuturecoaching.com or you can find me, Matteo Trevisan, at, um, uh, on LinkedIn. Awesome, it's, it's been absolutely lovely speaking with you, Matteo. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Robert. Cheers, thanks. Cheers.